Right, so hello everyone. Um, so the focus of our presentation will be on the ways in which film and theatre explore the human body. Um, so in order to do so, we are going to examine a text that has been translated both into a play and a film. Okay, so the text is George Moore's short story, The Singular Life of Albert Nobbs, <laughs> which was published in a collection of short stories by Moore in 1918. And his story was actually based upon real life events in which the body of a male waiter was discovered to be that of a woman upon his death, or her death rather, sorry. Um, this story then has consequently been adapted for stage by Simone Ben Moussa in 1978, and then again released in 2001 um, as a film and directed by Rodrigo Garcia. So the story revolves around the character of Albert Nobbs, um, a woman who in order to make a living is forced to live her life as a man. Um, Alex and I are currently working towards staging a production of the play and we thought it would be pertinent to focus our presentation on this text specifically. Okay, so both the film and the play explore how bodies are perceived and received by society and so they both offer an excellent platform from which to investigate how problematic bodies might be considered or presented theatrically and cinematically. Right, so I'm going to start with discussing how the body is perceived on stage. Um, before I do that, I'm first going to define two concepts the from theatre theory, uh, so performativity and theatricality. So in the 1980s, these two terms were devised in order to differentiate um, theatrical performance, so uh, a play on a stage, from any other type of performance, uh, basically. So how do these terms relate to the body? Well, basically, performativity is when one uses their body in a performative fashion, um, to do like a, a performance or a dance or um, so forth. Um, and it's not consigned to theatre, so performance isn't only something you find um, on stage. Uh, for example, this presentation is a performance, um, and so because we've got a presentation to, sh presentation to show you, you're our audience, and we're using gestures in a performative fashion to convey our ideas to you. Um, but however, this performance presentation isn't theatrical because we are uh, not playing parts, we're not um, addressing ourselves to you in a role, we are ourselves and we're not in a play. Um, so that is what the theatrical body does, it creates another reality on stage. So if you take the example of uh, production of Macbeth, um, for example, um, both the audience and the actor are aware that there are going to be two realities. That um, of the, well, say if we perform it here, that of the chapel, which is this reality, and that of Scotland, where Macbeth is set. So the difference between what something theatrical is and what something performative uh, is lies in this understanding between the audience and the actors. So to return to the theatre and uh, acting and embodiment, um, when an actor performs, we note that there is a presence and an absence. Um, so the actor is physically present, um, but the character isn't. However, in the reality of the play, um, the character is present. So this creates a paradox, which is known as the actor's paradox. And it's, you find it in um, all types of acting styles, regardless of how close the actor is physically um, to the characters. So it could be something from clowning, which is over the top and extravagant, to method acting, where a, uh, an actor tries to get as close as possible um, to the character. So this then poses the questions of how the body on stage is treated. Is it merely a canvas that we um, add another coat of paint to when we decide to portray a character? Or is there something more to be said about how the body is um, represented on stage? Um, I believe that there is more to be, more to be said, because um, whenever we use particular symbols or makeup codes and costume, there are social, political and artistic implications. Um, why? Because even though we are representing a, a fictional body, um, this fictional character is still an ideal, and ideals shape how we observe others and how we decide to present ourselves to others. So in relation to the play um, Singular Life of Albert Nobbs, um, Simon Ben Musa, the author, explores the idea of the absence of the body through the use of particular sound and lighting effects that ultimately dispense with the need for a body to be on stage at all. So this idea of absence leads to a reflection on the representation of the female body more particularly. Um, uh, so it suggests that a woman's body, if it is not clearly identified or portrayed um, as feminine, cannot exist. For example, the, the main character, Albert, 
is only ever seen in her male form, and so she doesn't exist uh, as a woman. The other female characters, uh, the, the, though they are minor, they are still treated as less than human, and because they are only half shown and half um, express themselves. So they are hidden, and therefore, because we can't see their full feminine forms, they aren't actually um, given um, an identity. Um, so this shows how gender roles uh, and bodies, uh, when they are represented on stage, are represented, are represented differently whether one plays a man or a woman. So the more feminine um, one is, the more visible and the more under scrutiny we are. So if we take the example of Shakespearean theatre, uh, men used to play female characters and so they would wear um, very um, highly artificial and very elaborate costumes to indicate the femininity of their characters. Whereas later on, when women, for example, cross-dressed as men on stage, it was all about concealing the feminine form. So we see how the feminine um, body is actually highly artificial and constructed. The play is also a reflection on performance in everyday life. Um, the plot is based on the true story, as we mentioned, of a person who was playing a part in real life. So this is an extreme example of how individuals present their bodies to the world in a performative fashion. Ben Musa shows the negative impact of this performance of identity in society on the main character, Albert, because Albert's performance of another ident identity, that of a man, ultimately leads, ultimately leads to the denial of herself and of her body and to her death at the end of the play. So the play critiques the ways in which certain representations of identity are restrictive and ultimately lethal in some ways. It's also an apology for hiding and protecting oneself from the constant and critical gaze of society. So there, are, there are probably always will be constant debates on issues of visibility and the critical gaze of society. And obviously the, the body cannot but be performative in social situations and interactions, but when we question certain extremes of representations, uh, through theatre, for example, this leads to a better understanding of the body within society and how we may better understand our own bodies and treat them better as well. Can I do a swap so that we... Yeah. <laughs> Quick change over. Okay. So I'm now going to explore how film then differs in its consideration of the performative body. Um, quite obviously, the cinematic event is distinct from the theatrical event in that what we're watching is not a live presentation, um, but rather a recorded representation of an edited reality. So my question is then, how does this alter our expectation of cinema in relation to liveness? And specifically, what is our expectation then of the live body? Okay. So as two interrelated, but some may argue increasingly codependent forms, theatre and cinema share an increasingly fractious relationship, shall we say. Um, Andre Bazan, a prominent film theorist, starts his essay entitled Film and Theatre by exploring this idea of presence and absence in the cinema, which is something that Vanessa has already talked about with regards to theatre. Bazan quotes Andre Guillet, who makes the all too common argument that the stage welcomes every illusion except that of presence. The actor is there. On the other hand, and inversely, the cinema accommodates every form of reality save one, the physical presence of the actor. So basically, in Guillet's opinion, the presence of the actor on stage is meant to grant us, the spectators, some sort of exquisite experience then which is denied in cinema. So Bazan himself contests this notion by claiming that it's false to say that the screen is incapable of putting us in the presence of the actor. He argues that it does so in the way of a mirror. Now, my argument to that would be that film actually does not act as a mirror because a mirror suggests that what we are witnessing is an image composed within the same time and space as that which we exist. To my mind, this is a claim more readily made of theatre, as Vanessa has already explored. Rather, my appraisal of cinema is aligned more closely with that of philosopher Stanley Cavell, who suggests that within film, we are presented with a world in which we do not and cannot inhabit either the same space as the characters or the same time. So basically, what Cavell means by this is that in theatre, we experience time as the characters do, but we do not occupy the same literal space. So again, to refer back to the Macbeth example, we can inhabit the same physical space as Macbeth, the chapel or the playhouse or wherever, but we cannot inhabit the same Scotland as Macbeth. In film, we can do neither. We are separate from the actors on the screen. Thus, film presents us with a world that we are absent from, but that does not mean that it is a world of absence. So this brings me then to my first question. What exactly do we mean by liveness? So is liveness only enabled by the physical presence of a live body, or could we possibly consider this term in a broader context in which liveness refers to the animation of the subject body. 
If so, then surely the characters on screen are as alive, as animated as the subjects on the stage. Yet it is clear to any spectator with their eyes opening that what they are watching in the theatre is not the same experience as that which they would get in the cinema. Cinema does not ask its spectators to, what, to believe that what they are seeing on the screen is happening in the here and now, as one might say in theatre, but rather to believe in the potential of that reality. So with that in mind, I'm now going to very quickly <laughs> turn my attention to the subject of our presentation, um, which is the film Albert Nobbs. So there are two elements here which I want to focus on. The first is how the director um, allows us to explore the body of Albert Nobbs, and the second is how he uses the actor, Glenn Close, to constantly remind us that this is a specific physical body that we are looking at. So the film opens with a shot of Albert's hands. Initially out of focus, the camera then sharpens its gaze, glides up over Albert's back to show us a shot of the back of his head. So we're exploring Albert's body here. The camera then follows his feet across the floor before finally granting us a shot of his entire figure, but significantly one that does not reveal his face. Indeed, it's only when the credits announce the title of the film, which is significant in and of itself, that we see Albert's face, as shown by the picture here on the PowerPoint. And once again, you can see we're not given a clear shot immediately. Um, first, his, appear his face appears in half light, then as the flame lights up the gas lamp, so too is Albert's face lit up, looking up and beyond the frame of, of the screen, engrossed in his world, from which we are physically but not spectatorly absent. So all of these tricks and techniques which the uh, director is using are designed to make us actively look at the character, explore his, or in this case, her body, and to question the construction of that body. So this leads me then quickly to my second point. The actor in cinema plays quite a different role to the actor in theatre. In cinema, we are constantly reminded that this is Glenn Close playing Albert Nobbs. The film is all about the transformation of Glenn Close into Albert Nobbs. The spectacle is how the costume, the lighting effects, the design and the camera angles have fashioned her body into a different body. So that's why I called attention to the title. This film is not about the singular life of Albert Nobbs as the play is, but rather about Albert Nobbs. So in this respect, we can gain more intimate knowledge of Albert than we ever could in theatre. So I'm going to conclude my very brief analysis here that by proposing in film, we can never be intimate with the characters as we can in theatre, but we can gain an intensely intimate knowledge of the characters. So what we may lose in the translation of bodies from stage to screen is a direct communion with the actor. What we gain is a privileged insight into a specific and a unique body as alive and animated as those on screen. So this dichotomy of theatre versus cinema is less a case then of presence versus absence, but rather contemporaneous presence versus potential presence. So we've discussed how we represent the body on stage and screen and how this has a direct correlation to social representations. So the closing question to this presentation is, how do we look? So this relates basically to your appraisal of us, for example, how you see us in this performance that we have just given. But it also questions what modes of looking we as a collective group, a society, would employ. So in an increasingly digitalised age, uh, an age of images, are we more likely to employ cinematic or theatrical modes of interpretation of understanding others? So how do we as individuals and as collectives look at each other?